Welcome to Architecture 345-445. This is the third module of our first uh, SciTech course, and it's the first one to talk about structures, structural design in particular. We call these modules structural technology and practice because we're really doing three things. We're looking at the kind of uh, mathematics or the theory behind structures, relatively lightweight, but there'll be some trigonometry, some algebra uh, in, in this module. We're looking at technology, in other words, the way that we solve problems, the tools that we have at our disposal, usually to build longer buildings or taller buildings. And we're emphasizing practice. So instead of being overly theoretical about this, we're going to try to take very quickly the things that we talk about theoretically and show how those actually show up in, in real practice. Not just structural engineering, but also architecture. One of the things that uh, I think is really important is that structure very often is the kind of grammar of the design that we uh, put together. It's one of the underlying rules. We have certain types of spans, certain rhythms, certain proportions that we end up with over and over again. And those really inform not just the way our buildings stand up, which is important, of course, but they're also very, very much linked to design. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in this introduction about how, instead of structural engineering, what we're really pushing is something I call structural design. Uh, two recommended textbooks, uh, Design Tech, you probably uh, have been uh, recommended for the other modules as well, sort of comprehensive uh, approach to building science. And then for these modules in particular, Structures by Design uh, by Professor Whitehead, uh, a lot of the uh, topics that are uh, covered briefly in Design Tech, uh, Rob's book goes into a great, uh, much greater amount of detail. And Structures by Design is really the basis for uh, the coursework in STP. So these are two recommended texts. Uh, again, Structures by Design is probably the closest uh, match for the material that we'll be going over in, in, in these modules. In 345-445, uh, we'll basically have uh, five large lectures that are broken down into two or three components, uh, usually of about 20 minutes or half an hour each. Uh, in this lecture, we'll be looking at uh, an introduction to structural design, some very basic principles, uh, and some history to show how these principles uh, have been put into action uh, over the last 3,500 years or so. Uh, week two will be a little bit more theoretical. We'll talk about vocabulary, in particular the types of loads that we put on structures, uh, why there's a difference between what we call live loads and dead loads, and, and why that's important. We'll introduce the uh, concept of vector mathematics, which sounds intimidating, but is actually just about uh, adding and subtracting uh, arrows. And then we'll talk about equilibrium. And this is the answer that we're always looking for. We want our buildings to stand still, and there's some mathematical tricks that we use uh, to talk about that or to define equilibrium in important ways. In week three, we'll get into actual structural stuff. So we'll look at uh, systems and elements. Uh, we'll talk in particular about the way that shape, strength, and stability uh, relate to one another. And uh, you'll have uh, a lab uh, in week three where we'll really get into the nitty gritty of designing structures and you'll design uh, small bridges, hopefully using these principles that will illustrate uh, how some of them go together. In the last two weeks, we'll talk more about equilibrium and this idea of what we call free bodies, uh, which is kind of a thought exercise that lets us get inside structural elements and think about uh, what sort of stresses they need to build up inside to keep them in equilibrium outside. And then finally, we'll talk uh, a little bit about building frames in the last week and some definitions about what we call load collectors, grounders, and stabilizers, how we put all these together to create frames that uh, not only stand up, but that we also keep from falling over, right? Two, way, two methods of structural failure that, that we want to avoid. So this week, uh, we will have our, uh, an introduction. So in this lecture, we'll talk about the five S's, uh, and then we'll have two lectures that show how uh, these get put into practice, two kind of short uh, lectures that, that'll show how these go into practice. So one is a sort of overview of the history of structural engineering, uh, important because I, I want to show how structures kind of underlies a lot of the architectural design that, that we're used to seeing. And then we'll do a couple of quick case studies and I'll talk about how uh, structural design really influenced one example of a long span structure uh, and one example of a, of a high rise.
So in this little uh, video, uh, we'll introduce the five S's. These are concepts that will be with us throughout the entire structural sequence. And they really are not only the kind of answers to what we're looking for, but also in some cases, uh, the tools, the way we achieve the, the desired structural outcomes that we have. Uh, an engineer that I worked with uh, once defined what they did, structural engineering, uh, as the stacking of things on top of one another with minimal injury. And what uh, they meant by this was that um, they, their job is basically to take all of the really, really heavy stuff that buildings are made out of, like concrete, steel, glass, even timber uh, is, is heavy, right? Is, has a, a, a big uh, load that is trying desperately to kind of fall down to the ground. Um, but also the things that we put into buildings are heavy. Uh, human beings, furniture, boxes of books, uh, bags of donuts, like you name it, things that go into a building all have mass, therefore they all have weight. And the structural engineer's job is to figure out both uh, what is likely to go into a building, how much the building itself is going to weigh, what some crazy client that uses the building is going to store in the building or move into the building, uh, and then figure out ways to handle those loads, to direct those loads in an efficient but also in a safe way uh, down to the ground. Um, this bit here about minimal injury reminds us that this is an area where bad things can happen. Buildings can collapse or they can fall over. Uh, structural elements can fail. And, and when this happens, uh, there are life safety issues. People die in building collapses. And so this is an area where we want to be very cautious, um, but it's also an area where we can spend a lot of resources, a lot of our client's budget, uh, a lot of carbon goes into building structures. And so we really want to find ways to uh, reliably, safely channel loads, but in ways that are also efficient. And this is always the kind of dance that we're doing with our structural engineers, trying to make structural elements smaller, trying to make them span farther or uh, rise taller, but to do this in ways that nevertheless are safe and where we can calculate, where we can uh, model or estimate where those loads are going to go, how they're going to flow down to the ground uh, safely and efficiently. To do this again, we think about five things. And in this video, I'll go into these in, in a little bit of detail. Um, usually we think of structural design as dealing with strength, right? How strong is the building? How much can it hold up? And this is certainly something that engineers will spend a lot of their time trying to figure out, right? What's the quote unquote ultimate strength of a building? In other words, when will it actually collapse? How much load will it take before it actually collapses? What is the working strength of a building? A kind of safe, conservative uh, estimate that is well below a uh, building's ultimate strength. And we're used to talking about these in, in kind of vernacular ways that we'll define in a little bit more detail as we go through these. So uh, will the building break? Will it crush? Will it snap? Will it fall over? These are all ways that we describe structural failures. And we'll talk about those uh, in more technical detail in a slightly more uh, engineering vocabulary as we go through these. But we also have these other ways that buildings can fail. And sometimes they're not as dramatic as actually falling down. Uh, sometimes they can be uh, problems with the kind of life cycle of the building or with the day-to-day -day life of the building. Um, stiffness is one thing that we take for granted in structures, but it's something that can also go horribly wrong. Uh, buildings can vibrate too much. They can move around in the wind and make occupants literally seasick. Uh, they can rack or uh, bend in, in ways that, for instance, crack windows or that uh, rack door frames and, and leave doors uh, locked shut. Um, stiffness is uh, something that we can calculate very easily, uh, but it's something that uh, can cause buildings to fail, maybe not in ways that make the six o'clock news with lots of injuries and, and, and maybe people uh, getting killed, but in ways that nevertheless mean that the building doesn't work or makes people uncomfortable. We think about buildings uh, standing up, but we also need to worry about keeping buildings from falling over in windstorms or in earthquakes. Um, this at first maybe doesn't seem like, like a big deal, right? Our buildings are really heavy, like they're not gonna fall over in the wind. But when we get tall buildings, when we get super light buildings, this is actually something that we do have to worry about. And we'll look at plenty of examples where we're trying to find structural form that is stable, 
that, that naturally stands up against both gravity loads and what we call lateral loads, wind loads or earthquake loads that affect the building from the side in addition to, to up and down. We have a, a fourth S that we call serviceability. How does the building work kind of day to day? And is the structure something that can be easily maintained? Uh, can we check it against corrosion? Is it uh, something that's going to uh, stay in one shape over, over time? Or is it going to what we call creep or very, very slowly flow and, and change shape? These are all issues that relate to serviceability or the, the life cycle of the building, the appropriateness of the structural system to its use. And then finally, the fifth S is the one that we as architects are often most interested in, and that is shape. And that is a description of a member or a system's overall design, right? Basically, what is the, what's the geometry of the structural system or the structural element? And time and time again, we'll come back to shapes that do particular jobs really, really well. Shape is one of the things we have to, uh, to, to address all of these other four S's that, that we want the building to be. Strong, stiff, stable, and serviceable. So to go through these in a little bit more detail, when we talk about strength, we're talking about a material property, something that is inherent to all concrete or all steel or all glass or all carbon fiber. And usually we're describing its resistance to breaking or crushing or snapping uh, or, 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 or a bending. Um, we measure this uh, usually in terms of uh, the, the strength of a material per square inch. And we talk about that resistance uh, as uh, something called stress. And usually we think of stress as a bad thing, but stress is actually the way that materials resist loads. And so when we talk about building up shear stress or building up bending stress, we're actually talking about the material doing something for us, right? doing something that can help us. Structural elements can uh, fail due to strength in five basic ways. We'll look at these in a second. Uh, and we have very, very good information on almost all building materials, uh, concrete, steel, timber, uh, especially, um, that give us allowable stresses. In other words, the amount that we can stress a single square inch of a material, um, usually a square inch of a material, uh, for each of these modes. So we'll go to uh, steel handbooks or concrete handbooks, and we'll look up the allowable stress in, say, tension or bending or torsion uh, for a given material, and we'll be able to plug that into some relatively simple formulas, usually, to figure out whether the, the element that we've designed is actually strong enough uh, to carry the load. So, for example, one that we'll use quite a bit is A36 steel. A36 is a particular alloy that we use for probably 95, 98% of our architectural needs. And it has what's called an allowable stress of 22,000 pounds per square inch in both tension and compression. What does that mean? Well, that means that if you have a, a steel bar that is one inch by one inch, you could hang a weight on the end of it that was 22,000 pounds uh, and the steel would behave in ways that we found acceptable. The ultimate strength of A36 steel is actually, as you might get from its designation, 36,000 pounds. That's the strength at which we expect the steel to actually fail. And you can see if we're only allowed to stress that steel up to 22,000 pounds per square inch, there's what we call a factor of safety built in. We never want to stress materials to their ultimate or breaking strength. We always wanna have some reserve in there because we don't really know what our clients are gonna to do to our building, right? How they're gonna load it up. And here you see uh, Frank Lloyd Wright testing the working strength of a, of a concrete column uh, for the Johnson Wax building uh, in Racine. And basically what they are doing is they are loading up the top of this column and they have estimated the working strength of concrete. They know the area of that column uh, and they're testing to make sure that the greatest possible load that's ever gonna be put on that uh, isn't going to break or crush uh, the column below. Here are the five ways that we typically measure uh, strength. Um, compression and tension, these are what we call axial loads. And these are pretty easy. Uh, a one inch steel bar, you can put 22,000 pounds uh, on it. A uh, two square inch steel bar, you can put twice as much load on it, right? It, it's, a, it's a linear 
uh, relationship. Compression gets a little bit tricky because uh, snapping or breaking or crushing isn't the only way that the columns can fail. But here we're basically talking about the cross-sectional area resisting uh, load because the material has a very, very reliable, allowable strength uh, in, in tension or compression. These, shear, torsion, and bending, shear the, the tendency of uh, material to slide uh, past itself, just as if you were taking kitchen shears and, and slicing paper. Uh, torsion, the, tendency, or the resistance of the material to twisting. And then bending, which we'll deal with quite a bit, which is, um, in, in engineering terms, the combined effect of tension on one side, pulling part of the, the element apart, and compression on the other side, pushing part of the element together. These get really tricky, in part because they're not just about uh, how much load we're putting onto the element, but they're also about where that load is getting placed and how that load affects uh, the, the material, not just on any given square inch, but actually across the, the section. We'll use some of the same allowable stresses that we use for axial loads when we're calculating bending uh, or shear. But as we'll see, those are related in ways that make us think about these loads slightly differently. Related to strength, but slightly different, is what we call stiffness. And stiffness is the, the, the resistance of a material to deflection. In other words, when we load up uh, a beam, for example, or let's take this, this guy here, when we, when we lift up a giant barbell, um, we we're asking that barbell to carry the load of the weights at the end back into our arms and shoulders. And as you can see, the weights on the end of the barbell are going to cause the barbell to deflect. Uh, the weights are going to droop a little bit. Every material has some resistance to deflection, but no material has an infinite resistance to it. And so anytime we put a load on any structure, that structure is going to change shape. Maybe very subtle, we may not even be able to notice it, maybe fractions or hundredths of an inch, but when we load a structure, it will deflect. If we use stiff materials like concrete, it will deflect less. If we use uh, materials that are not stiff, uh, say uh, rubber, you know, jello, like whatever, um, that building structure will deflect quite a bit. So we have a, a kind of palette of materials we can use. Uh, depending on the range of, of stiffness that we want, both in the final building and also, if you think about it, in working those materials. Uh, a material that's very, very stiff, like steel, requires special tools to shape it, whereas a material like wood, uh, we can actually shape by hand. Steel is a much stiffer material. Wood is a less stiff, or what we say, uh, we say more ductile material. A wood frame building will deflect more than a steel frame building of the same size, but it's easier to build, right? Easier to work the, 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 uh, the material. Usually we want materials that are both strong and stiff, right? We want them to resist failure, but we also don't want them to flop around in the wind. We don't want our floors to bounce up and down when we walk on them. So we want materials that are strong and stiff. And fortunately, these are generally related. Strong materials tend to be stiff materials. Weak materials tend to be more flexible. And we have a, a lot of data that allows us to put together what we call stress-strain diagrams. So this is a chart showing uh, typical building materials, and it, it, it relates how strong they are, stronger materials over on the right, weaker materials over on the left, and how stiff they are, how well they, def they resist deflection. Uh, flexible materials on the bottom, stiff materials on the top. And not a lot of surprises, right? Steel is much, much stronger than timber, as we just said, um, but it is also much, much stiffer. There's some interesting things if you look closely at this chart, right? Wood has two ranges of strength and stiffness, depending on whether we're loading wood parallel to the grain or perpendicular to it. And this explains why we see wood columns with the grain running in the direction of the column, that we gain strength. We also gain stiffness when we orient the, the wood grain properly. There's some other interesting things here, too. Um, people are often surprised to see that steel and glass are roughly as strong. Glass is a very, very strong material if we treat it right. Um, it's actually not quite as stiff as steel. And we know some things about the ultimate strength of glass in uh, shear and in bending, 
where it's very, very different uh, from steel. And so we don't use it in all of the same structural uh, situations that we do with steel. And here's another one. Uh, aluminum and steel uh, are uh, nearly the same strength. Uh, some alloys of steel are much stronger than some aluminum alloys. Um, but you can see that aluminum is more ductile. It's down further on the stiffness scale, meaning that it's a little bit more flexible. This explains why when we have two legitimate structural metals, we tend to see steel used for uh, building structures uh, because it has better resistance to deflection. Aluminum we tend to use when we need to shape very precise uh, things like mullions or, uh, or, or fixtures inside of a building because it's more workable. It's less stiff and therefore we have more ways to shape it than we do steel. It's also generally not quite as strong, but the important thing here is that aluminum is much more ductile. It's a much more flexible material uh, than steel. Now, these are also related by what we call stress-strain diagrams where we're looking at the behavior of a material as we add more and more load to it. This is a stress strain curve for steel. And you can see that we have two uh, ranges. We have what's called an elastic range. and We have what's called a plastic range. Stress goes uh, up here on the left. Strain goes here on the right. And what's happening here is that a laboratory is loading up a steel sample. They're adding uh, material to it. Uh, until they see a change in the material behavior, uh, what's called the yield point. And what's interesting here is that you can see that there's a straight line up to what we call the yield point or the elastic limit. And then the, the steel, once it's loaded to this point, it will deflect without any additional load. So we can actually even take a little bit of the load off at that point. And because the steel has reached its yield point, it will deform, it will stretch uh, without us putting any more load onto it. Uh, at some point that stops. If we keep loading it, we find that it'll uh, stretch a little bit more. And then at some point we get what's called a, a fracture. You can imagine that um, we certainly don't want our steel elements to fracture. And so from a strength point of view, we have way out here uh, an allowable uh, stress that we can put onto it. But we also don't want to get our steel up to the yield point because once it changes its deflection here, this is where it is permanently deformed. You can see that we don't need to add any more load to it and the steel will keep uh, deflecting. So this gives us a kind of workable area, what we call the elastic range. We're always working in an area where the relationship between the stress on a material and the strain on the material uh, is reliable. Uh, we call this the elastic range. Modulus of elasticity is really a measure of the material's stiffness. So we measure strength, ultimate strength over here. We measure stiffness basically, uh, or we measure the, the uh, yield point here, and we're usually taking a, uh, a factor of safety either from the ultimate strength or from the yield point, depending on the material. We're always trying to work down here uh, in this zone. We don't want our materials to deform permanently. We don't want them to, to deform too much ever, but we certainly don't want to stretch the material to the point where it's, it's never coming back. Uh, we certainly don't want them to, to fracture. Um, one way to think of this is to take a plastic bag and to stretch it until uh, it breaks. And as it does that, what you'll find is that the plastic at some point hits its yield point. It's hard to stretch, hard to stretch, hard to stretch, and all of a sudden it gets very, very easy to stretch. And if you let go of it, when it's in that uh, easy to stretch range, you'll find that the plastic doesn't snap back, right? It stays stretchy. That stretchy plastic is in this plastic range beyond its yield point, but not yet to its ultimate strength. If you come back and stretch it again, you may find that it puts up a, a surprising amount of resistance uh, when you uh, pull it uh, really, really far, and then it'll snap all at once. And that is what we call strain hardening. You can see that the curve is going back up here. So more stress uh, getting put into it. And ultimate strength is where finally uh, the material gives way and eventually fractures. And that's the same kind of behavior in a plastic bag as it is in steel. Numbers, of course, are much different, right? Steel has much higher values of uh, strength, but also of stiffness. So how do we use these? Well, let's take a formula that we'll come back to in a couple of classes when we're trying to figure out 
how much a simply supported beam will bend at the middle. We have a formula for that that I think if you dissect it a little bit shows us how we can actually resist uh, deflection. We have a couple of tools uh, to work with. So in this equation, the small letter d is the distance that the beam will deflect at mid-span. Uh, and, and this formula on the right has been calculated from years and years of theory and experimental uh, 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 um, laboratory experiments where they actually break materials. There are a couple of constants, the 5 and the 384 just come out of the, the kind of calculus that's used to derive the formula. But if you look at the variables, we have two things uh, that we're usually trying to uh, uh, address. One of them is a load that we're putting on the beam, and that is, in this case, W, right? The total weight of the beam and what it's carrying. And the other is the total length of the beam, the span. So if you think about it, the greater the load, right, the load is on top of the fraction here, the greater the load, the more the beam is going to deflect, right? This is intuitive. When we add more weight to a beam, it's going to sag a little bit more. But also note that the longer the beam is, the greater the deflection is going to be in real numbers. So if we have a 100-foot long beam, it's going to deflect more at the mid-span than if we have a 2-foot long beam. So these are very often what you can think of as the, the kind of program for a beam, right? We want it to carry a load. We want it to carry that load over a span, right, over a, a given length. So what's underneath the fraction, right, as these two numbers, E and I, get higher, the deflection is going to be less and less. Now, what are those? Well, E is this figure modulus of elasticity, which is a numerical measure of a material's stiffness, it's measured in inches squared, and the uh, modulus of elasticity, or the stiffness of steel, is 29 million pounds per square inch. Don't worry about it for the moment. We'll get into this uh, in, a, in a lot of detail uh, down the road. Um, but of course, the higher the stiffness, the less the deflection, right? A, a steel beam spanning 10 feet is going to deflect less than a timber beam uh, or a beam made of rubber. And the other thing we have is this uh, number I, which is a measurement of the beam's cross-sectional shape. This is measured in inches cubed. An I-beam, W shape, has a very, very high I, or moment of inertia is the, the, the technical term for it. Uh, a flat rectangle has a very low one. Again, nothing you need to worry about at the moment, but know that shape is the way that we have, is one of the ways that we have to address deflection. Look at the formula, right? What's on top of the, uh, the, the fraction is going to cause the beam to deflect more weight and the span. And what's on the bottom of the, of the fraction is what we have to resist that deflection, the stiffness of a material and the shape of the beam, the cross-sectional shape of the beam. This we can pick from basically a palette of structural materials that we have. This is design. This is us figuring out what the shape of the beam really wants to be. So getting out of the materials for a minute, right? Uh, strength and stiffness both have this material component to it. Um, when we kind of zoom way out and look at the third S, stability, now we're in the realm of the designer. Stability is a geometric property that means that our structure is going to be in equilibrium under any loading condition. This doesn't matter what the material is. Stability is all about the design. It's all about the geometry. It's all about the shape. Um, we have a couple of things working for us. There is the property, of course, that any three points in space define a plane. And what that means is that if we have only three legs to a stool, for example, uh, that stool can only have one uh, condition of equilibrium, right? The three legs have to be planar, and there's nothing that is going to kind of make it rock back and forth, right? A three-legged stool is actually more stable than a four-legged stool. A four-legged stool, um, they all, all the legs have to be exactly equal. If they're not, you've got to come and you've got to shove an envelope or something under one of the legs until they're in equilibrium. Um, triangles are, for this reason, a structural engineer's best friend. And one of the constant debates that we'll have as architects with structural engineers is we, of course, want rectangular spaces. Structural engineers want triangular panels or triangular structures. Equilibrium is always the goal, almost, 
instability. We want buildings that don't move up or down or left or right. We also want buildings that don't fall over or rotate uh, about any point. These are two states of stability or equilibrium that we call translational and rotational equilibrium. Translational means moving through space. Rotational means moving around a point. And the science of keeping these all uh, stable in, in every direction and around every point uh, is called statics. We do not want our buildings to move. We are not studying dynamics, uh, where, which is the science of things that are moving. We are studying statics. Therefore, we are always after stability. This is a design property, right? It doesn't matter what the material is. A three-legged stool is always going to be stable. Uh, a a one-legged stool, no matter what material we use, uh, is never going to be stable. So as an example, right, here's our three-legged stool. Uh, you cannot imagine a scenario where uh, that stool is going to be tippy, right? No matter what the floor does underneath it, the stool will find a, a position of equilibrium when all three legs are touching the ground. And they will always be able to do this, right? They will define a plane just geometrically. A two-legged stool, though, will never find equilibrium. Uh, we may be able to balance it, but it's only going to take a very, very small lateral force, from the left or the right, to cause that stool to tip over. Doesn't matter how strong we make the material. That stool could be timber, could be carbon fiber. It is not going to be stable. Now, you may look at this and say, oh, but once I sit down in it, my feet are going to form the third leg of the tripod. And that's absolutely right. This is a commercially available stool, and that is the entire point behind it, that your feet form the third leg of the tripod. But the stool on its own is not a valid structure, right? Never going to be stable. Serviceability is uh, one of the S's that is maybe most difficult to explain, but it basically describes how appropriate the structure is uh, over its lifespan. The ability uh, of that structure to be immediately useful and then over a course of 30 or 40 years. Um, we may have a structure that when it's opened meets all of its deflection criteria, uh, but it moves in ways that over time loosen the connections or the material that we've made it out of might corrode. The connections might uh, decay in ways that make it uh, less useful, attractive, or durable. Um, the most kind of chilling example of this is the Morandi Viaduct, uh, which was in Genoa, Italy, uh, collapsed uh, in, in, in 2018. And the reason it collapsed was that the uh, steel within these uh, uh, these tension elements here, the steel inside encased in concrete began corroding from within. And there was no good way to see this uh, because the concrete surrounded the, the, the steel tendons. Um, this particular tower, the tendons corroded badly enough that in a windstorm, uh, the differential stresses, the bridge kind of rocking back and forth, uh, one of these tendons snapped and this entire portion of the bridge uh, collapsed. Uh, killing about 40 people. So that's a structural failure uh, that has less to do with the original design, right? The bridge stood for 40 years uh, and more to do with the way that structure behaved over time, whether it could even be serviced uh, over time. And then finally, the S that we as architects are most concerned with is shape, a uh, description of a member or a system's overall design, right? the geometry of, of the system. Um, we build uh, knowing these kind of static principles, knowing these basics about column design or beam design or slab design uh, or about building stability. Uh, and those tell us where to deploy materials, materials that are good structural materials, um, where that material can do the most good in terms of where the, the forces and loads uh, in a structure go. Structural design, structural architecture, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, is the geometrical response that matches the performance we want, span and the, the weight carrying capacity with all of these issues, uh, total weight of the structure uh, that it has to carry on its own, the way we fabricate it, the way it integrates with the spaces we want, and frankly, aesthetics, right? We want our structures to look good. So uh, structures like this, this is a prototype a uh, bus shelter designed by SOM. Uh, among the designers at SOM is an Iowa State uh, MARC alum uh, who worked on this. And here, a related set of what we call shear moment diagrams. Uh, 
uh, drawings that we do when we're trying to figure out how uh, a beam is going to carry a load. And you can see that there are some definite parallels between the way this bus shelter is shaped and the shape of what we call the moment diagram, where we're trying to figure out where the, 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 best, the biggest loads uh, that it's going to carry, uh, the biggest bending loads that it's going to carry are going to occur. And you can see that they have tuned the shape of the beam to what they have estimated the moment diagram is going to be. This applies not just on the scale of elements like beams and girders, but also uh, to larger buildings, uh, larger building systems. So stability, one of the fundamental principles of stability is that in a windstorm, you spread your feet apart and you give yourself uh, a greater, what we'll call resistance to overturning moment. In other words, if your feet are spread further apart, the wind has a harder time trying to knock you down. Um, some buildings, Hancock Tower in Chicago, uh, follow this principle. Hancock is a great example of structural architecture, and it starts really from the overall building form, right? Wider at the base, skinnier at the top. Good uh, resistance to winds blowing in any direction. We see buildings that uh, sometimes violate this, and um, this building, Rainier Square in Seattle, perfectly stable, right? It is actually strong enough. It's resisted winds and earthquakes for 40 or 50 years now. But there's something in that building shape that aesthetically, I think people tend to react to negatively, right? We like our buildings uh, to look stable in addition to being stable. And being skinnier at the base, wider at the top, um, the building just doesn't look stable, right? It doesn't look like it's going to fall over, or it looks like it's going to fall over. So this is an issue of uh, shape where even though the building is uh, on the right, is actually stable, does actually stand up, it violates something about what we kind of intuitively know uh, about structures. Okay, in all of this, right, we will balance the need to do a little bit of math to calculate how loads and forces flow through building structures. And we'll leave most of that though to professional engineers. You as a practicing architect will never actually calculate a beam or a column or a slab. Right? You will go to a structural engineer, they are licensed to do that work. You, unless you go on and get an engineering degree, uh, will not be. Nevertheless, we'll go through some math to talk about what those engineers are going through, how the process works, so that you're at least armed with a kind of fluency in what the processes are, and also so that you can see how some of the nuts and bolts uh, of these static issues work. More to the point though, what we want to get across is that all five of these S's um, can be talked about in terms of mathematics, but they can also be talked about in terms of intuition, in terms of a basic understanding of what structural shapes are good for what sort of situations. And the exercises that we will have you do, here's a SciTech alum uh, with an with a, a intuitively designed uh, structural arch, the exercises that we'll uh, have you do are ways of trying to get that kind of um, fluency uh, in your brain, right, with, with a little bit of math, but with a lot more kind of thought problems, uh, and a lot more actually building stuff. In the second half of this lecture, um, we'll look at a bunch of case studies, first from uh, history, looking at a, a very brief history of 3,500 years of, of structural engineering, where all of these five S's will crop up at various times. And then we'll do a slightly deeper dive into two case studies, a long span and a high rise, and show how issues of uh, structure, uh, strength, stiffness, stability, uh, but also serviceability and, and fabrication come into play.